They are images all too familiar, but every time they are just as frightening. A shooting inside an American high school, this time in Houston. A former student armed with a rifle. Students and staff running for cover. Friday night lights on Capitol Hill as divided Democrats try to hammer out an infrastructure deal. President Biden paying an afternoon visit to lobby his caucus. He says they'll get it done, but what will it take to get progressives to come along? A possible breakthrough in how we treat COVID-19. Drug maker Merck with promising new data for an antiviral pill that could slash the risk of hospitalization and death. We dig into the details, when it could become available, and what it may mean for the broader push to vaccinate the nation. The child care crisis as a labor shortage takes hold and staffing plummets coast to coast, our closer look at the challenge. The families hit the hardest and what some child care facilities are doing about it. I'm sitting here watching my life's work perhaps dwindle away and it's very sad. It's really very sad. Sailing Towards Success, it's a program that helps teens in foster care chart a new course for life, and school is in session on the high seas. We go on board in tonight's America Strong. When you're on a sailboat, you have no choice. You have to work together as a team. You have to build that foundation of a relationship. And Disney World at 50, a half century after the Magic Kingdom opened its doors to its first guests, a golden anniversary, and a major celebration. Good evening, I'm Andrew Dimbert, in for Lindsey Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We begin tonight with all eyes on Washington in a high stakes first Friday in October that featured plenty of lobbying, but no concrete resolution among divided Democrats. This is a live look at Capitol Hill where the sun has set without a vote on a $1 trillion infrastructure bill to fund the nation's roads, bridges, and highways. It was just before 4 p.m. that President Biden arrived on Capitol Hill to do something he did for 36 years as a senator negotiate, in this case within his own caucus, behind closed doors. Less than an hour later, he emerged, giving a thumbs up and a fist pump and vowing, quote, we're going to get it done, downplaying any disarray but offering no timetable for action. That vote was first delayed by progressives seeking assurances on a massive human infrastructure bill to follow. President Biden has floated a new potential price tag, but will they bite? ABC's Rachel Scott has the latest on the state of play. With his domestic agenda on the line, President Biden today traveling to Capitol Hill to try and unite his own party. Mr. President, any compromise? The president meeting with House Democrats for just over half an hour. I'm telling you, we're going to get this done. Why is that so it doesn't matter when. It doesn't matter whether it's in six minutes, six days, or six weeks. We're going to get it done. Why? Sources in the meeting tell us the president floated a compromise between moderates in the Senate and progressives in the House, a $1.9 to $2.2 trillion price tag for a sweeping bill covering everything from early childhood education to health care to fighting climate change. Progressives want $3.5 trillion, saying until there's a vote on that, they won't support the separate bipartisan infrastructure bill. We need a vote. We need, a, we need to be real. Are we going to deliver universal pre-K to this country or not? Are we going to expand health care to our seniors and include vision and dental or not? But the head of the Progressive Caucus hinting if Speaker Pelosi and President Biden can reach an ironclad agreement with moderate senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, that might be enough. I want to be assured that there is no delay and that there's no misunderstandings about what we agreed to. Um, and so if there's something else that's short of a vote that somebody can offer me that gives me those same assurances, I want to listen to that. But Jayapal saying... They're not there yet. Does, does, your, does half your caucus do? Me? Yeah. I'm here, baby. I'm here. <laughs> Rachel Scott joins us now. So it looks like this overall spending bill will come down from that big $3.5 trillion figure. How did the president address that in his closed door meeting with Democrats? Well, the president, Andrew, acknowledged what he is faced with, and that is a very, very thin margin in both the House and the Senate. Over in the House, Democrats can only afford to lose three votes. The Senate, as you know, is split 50-50, cannot afford to lose a single Democrat. So the president floating this compromise, saying that it could go into, you know, basically the high, uh, the high $1 trillion, $1.9 to maybe $2.2 trillion, basically trying to find a price tag that can get both moderates and progressives on board. 
airport. But this is going to be the challenge. The president even canceled a trip uh, earlier this week to Chicago to work on this. But tonight, they just still do not have the votes to get this passed. And that is the reality and the challenge the president is still facing. Okay, and we heard from Congresswoman Jaya Paul, the head of the Progressive Caucus, at the end of your report. How are other Democrats responding? Yeah, and the Progressive Caucus actually was huddled behind closed doors now, basically talking about that meeting with the president. They just addressed uh, reporters just a few minutes ago. And listen, they are really firm on this, Andrew. They say they are willing to stick this out as long as it takes. The bottom line, they need to see some type of framework, some type of text, some type of deal on that larger reconciliation piece, that $3.5 trillion uh, package that would include everything from funding to uh, child care to money to combat climate change. They want to see that on the table, and then they want to review it before they move forward with a, a vote on the bipartisan infrastructure package. And I can tell you that there were really some mixed uh, feelings uh, leaving the president's meeting today. I talked to one moderate Democrat who told me that the president did not lay out a strategy, he did not lay out a timeline, and that he was massively disappointed by what the president said. That member going on to say that victory would have been laying out a pathway forward, and right now they still do not have that. Rachel Scott in D.C. covering everything. Thank you, Rachel. We appreciate it. And let's bring ABC News political director Avery Harper in. Avery, you heard Rachel's reporting on the $2 trillion compromise being floated for the second spending bill. Is that a number that progressives will work with? Right. Well, I, I think when you listen to progressive lawmakers, they want to see that uh, the programs and the issues that are included in that budget reconciliation plan, that they could be adequately addressed. And uh, there's not necessarily a, a number uh, that is going to be attached to that. Uh, whatever the number is that conservative Democrats uh, agree to, they want to be able to see uh, that those issues, education, climate change, health care, uh, that they could be adequately addressed with, with whatever that number is. And, and they just don't have uh, the information yet to, to be able to determine that. And as we also heard there from Rachel Scott, we're already hearing critical feedback about the president's visit and strategy from Democrats who were in that room. Put this caucus divide in the context of the broader White House legislative agenda. Is there a risk in President Biden waiting it out? Right. Well, you know, Democrats often talk about being a big ten. We've seen uh, the the deep fundamental philosophical differences between uh, some of those conservative Democrats and, and members of the Progressive Caucus. Uh, you know, this is a major piece of Biden's agenda. And if it doesn't get done, if this bipartisan infrastructure deal doesn't pass, uh, if the budget reconciliation plan doesn't pass, while uh, Democrats have control of the White House, uh, the Senate, and the House of Representatives, Democrats run the risk of looking incapable of governing, and, and that could have consequences during midterms. And with so much focus on the Democrats trying to figure out their next move, I've got to ask, what are Republicans saying tonight? Well, the fact is, they really don't have to say much. They don't have a dog in this fight. Uh, look, I think that, you know, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle want to see uh, that bipartisan infrastructure plan pass uh, because, uh, you know, lawmakers on all parts of the spectrum can agree uh, that infrastructure needs to be uh, invested in. Uh, but this budget reconciliation plan, this is not their fight. ABC's Deputy Political Director Avery Harper, thanks for joining us. And now to today's major, major headlines in the fight against the pandemic. Drug maker Merck announcing a promising new treatment in the form of a pill for people who have symptoms of COVID. The company saying it reduces the risk of hospitalization and death by 50 percent. And the FDA announcing key meetings for October, looking at more booster shots and vaccines for young children. Here's ABC's Whit Johnson. Tonight, a potential game changer in the battle against the virus. The first antiviral medication specifically designed to treat COVID-19. Pharmaceutical giant Merck announcing that trials show its new drug, Molnupiravir, may cut the risk of hospitalization or death in half. This is a pill you can take at home and it will significantly reduce the risk that you either ultimately are hospitalized or more importantly, that you would ever fa face the unfortunate uh, outcome of death. The drug course consists of four pills taken every 12 hours for five days, beginning soon after testing positive. The trial included 775 patients with mild to moderate COVID who had at least one risk factor for severe disease. After 29 days, no deaths reported in patients who received the drug, compared to eight deaths in patients who got a placebo. The drug also appeared to be effective against variants of concern like the Delta strain. To take something which is such a devastating disease like 
and COVID-19 and, and hopefully turns it into something that's manageable. Merck saying the results of their phase three trial were so promising, they ended it more than a month early with support from the FDA and plan to apply for emergency use authorization within days. The news uh, of the efficacy of this particular antiviral is obviously very good news. They will be submitting their data to the FDA imminently. Uh, the data are impressive. While other treatments like monoclonal antibodies require patients to be infused at a hospital or clinic, these pills would only need a prescription and could be taken at home. Data on two more antiviral drugs from Pfizer and Roche are also expected in the coming months. But health officials insist they are not replacements for the vaccine. Vaccination is our best defense against COVID-19. We have the scientific tools needed to put an end to this pandemic. Across the country, a sweeping push for vaccine mandates. California today becoming the first state in the nation to require the vaccine for all students as soon as it gets final FDA approval for each age group. We want to end this pandemic. We are all exhausted by it. The governor pointing out that schools already require multiple vaccines for diseases like measles and mumps, saying vaccines work. <laughs> And in New York City, despite protests and a last-minute appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, which was denied, time running out late today for school staff to get vaccinated or lose their jobs by Monday. It wasn't an easy decision because, you know, I'm giving up first and foremost how I support my family. You know, I'm, I'm a single mom. Still, the city's saying 90 percent of school employees now have at least one shot. This mandate has worked, and the goal was protect, to protect kids, including our youngest kids who can't be vaccinated yet. And tonight, word of another breakthrough infection. The Supreme Court confirming Justice Brett Kavanaugh has tested positive for COVID-19. He's been vaccinated since January and is currently showing no symptoms. Witt joins us now, and Witt, going back to that decision from the Supreme Court on whether they would block the vaccine mandate for teachers in New York, what was the decision? Andrew, we're learning it was Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor who denied that request for an emergency injunction against New York City's vaccine mandate for school employees. She has the power to make that call because she oversees the Second Circuit, including New York. Sotomayor did not release a statement, and she did not refer the matter to the full court for a vote. Andrew? Whit Johnson, thank you. I'm joined now by Dr. John Brownstein, Chief Innovation Officer at Boston Children's Hospital and an ABC News contributor. Thanks for being here, doctor. Now, we've heard the word breakthrough a lot today about this new treatment from Merck. If the data holds up, just how significant could this be to have an oral pill that helps fight COVID? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I actually think this is a huge advance in our fight to counter COVID. Take a pill for five days and reduce your chances of hospitalization. You know, what Merck found is essentially hospitalizations were cut by 50% in high-risk individuals, older or obese or those with cardiovascular disease. And that was true for across all variants, including Delta. And we know that these antivirals have worked for other diseases. And so we're seeing this, you know, being applied to COVID. And the fact is that this trial was stopped early because it was deemed unethical to proceed because of the amazing impact that this drug could have. So, you know, there's a lot to think about here in terms of its rollout. You know, you need to implement this drug within five days of symptom onset. Um, but the, the idea is if you can get this drug to people, it will make a really big impact in our battle against COVID. And we know there are still billions of people around the world who have yet to get any vaccine. So what could this pill mean globally for containing the pandemic and for addressing some of those inequity issues that we've seen around the world treating and preventing COVID? You know, I think it could be a game changer. You know, Merck expects to produce millions of doses. And, you know, I think this will mean, you know, broader access. We do have to consider pricing here in the U.S. You know, the vaccine itself is about $39. The treatment is about $700. So we do have to be concerned about affordability and accessibility to everyone here in this country. But I do think, you know, Merck is uh, signing agreements with other countries and thinking about pricing that is tiered to make sure that this drug is more accessible across the globe. And that's great. And, you you know, drug is interesting because it's easier to manufacture, store, and access than vaccines. But I do have to point out the vaccines are still our weapon against this pandemic, and we have to keep focusing on vaccine equity and accessibility. But, you know, this drug is incredibly exciting. 
Which leads to my next question, because here in the U.S., we're still experiencing vaccine hesitancy. Is there a concern that those that are still resisting getting vaccinated might just say, hey, if there's a pill that can cut hospitalizations and deaths in half, why do they need to get the shot? You know, it's a really good question, and it's one that I'm concerned about, this issue that, you know, this drug will undermine the vaccine rollout and lead to hesitancy. You know, we have tens of millions of people in that wait-and-see category, or they're just choosing not to get the vaccine. But we have to remind people, it's not an either-or. We do not want to put people in harm's way with this virus. You know, we have severe illness, death, and long COVID. So it's not a choice. It's, you know, the vaccine is there and will help reduce your risk, but also the risk for the community. But at the same time, this pill will be there as a safety net for those that are potentially high risk and they're vulnerable. We need to focus on the upstream impacts of this virus. Yes, downstream is important, but you know, we should be thinking about these in tandem and not you know, as a choice between two products. Finally, the FDA today announced some key meetings of its advisory panel for the month of October. Just outline the importance of those meetings for potential approval of maybe more booster shots and for vaccines for children between ages 5 and 11. Yeah, the FDA is going to have a very busy October. Uh, we, of course, you know, a number, millions of people that have had the Moderna vaccine or J&J &J are waiting to see about boosters. And so on October 14th, they'll be looking at Moderna booster potential. Uh, on October 15th, they'll be looking at the one-dose J&J &J shot and whether that needs a booster. I think likely we'll see, you know, authorizations there. There's going to be studies around mixing and matching. A lot of questions about whether you had one vaccine, can you take the other? And I think the biggest, you know, question is going to be on October 26th, the meeting around that vaccine for five to 11 year olds. And, you know, this is exciting because, you know, the FDA is already thinking about meeting even ahead of the submission of data by Pfizer. So, you know, this idea that you could get potential, you know, authorization ahead of Halloween is feasible. I think likely it could still take weeks. And remember, this is an advisory group that then, you know, has to go to the FDA to approve it and then CDC to, to really refine recommendations. So it could take a few weeks after that October 26th, but, you know, it's really exciting that, you know, potentially end of October or into November, we'll see shots in the arms of younger kids and get that protection that we've all been waiting for. Of course, we have to see the data and the FDA has to take its time. But again, all very exciting developments that might take place in the month of October. Okay, we'll just have to wait and see. Thank you, Dr. Brownstein. Thanks so much. Now to a terrifying incident at a Houston high school. Police were called to the scene of a shooting in progress. A staff member shot in the back and the suspect a former student. ABC's Kenneth Moten is at the scene. Tonight, sings a panic at this Houston school. Just before noon, reports of an active shooter on the campus. There's a man with a gun in the school. Police say the gunman, identified as a 25-year-old former student at Yes Prep Southwest, was armed with a rifle and shot his way into the school. The front door, it's a glass door, it was locked. He gained entry by shooting through a glass door and immediately fired upon uh, one of the uh, employees of the school. That employee, the school's principal, was struck in the back, rushed to the hospital in serious condition. Police in tactical gear swarming the scene. We got spin shell casings inside, so we're up against a rifle. Anybody coming in this building, make sure you got your plates and helmets. Within minutes, police confronting the gunman, who they say surrendered immediately. More than a thousand middle and high school students evacuating with their hands up. Anxious parents there to meet them. I got her. I got her. It's a blessing. Because as you can see, she shook up too. I just want to get her home, to get her safe, and just love on her. Kenneth Moten joins us now. And Kenneth, any updates on injuries and also a possible motive? Well, Andrew, still no motive from the police, but they are still investigating. We've also learned that while no students were injured, that one shooting victim, a school administrator, was actually the principal of this school. We understand from our ABC station here in Houston, KTRK, that he is expected to survive and he could be released from the hospital by tonight. Now, we also know that the students here, they just went through an active shooter drill two days ago. Andrew? Kenneth Moten there in Houston. Thank you. When we come back, the deadly midair collision and the investigation into how a small plane collided into a helicopter. A beautiful story, just the type we need on a Friday. We travel to a school down in Florida helping foster kids learn to sail. But up next, what do you do as a parent when your critical child care quits? It's happening across the country as the great resignation is now causing a crisis in many homes. Our in-depth look next. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Roe v. Wade, now for the first time ever on television. She was once the baby at the heart of this landmark decision, and now she breaks her silence almost 50 years later. Why now? What does she want you to know? Your mere conception brought about arguably the most controversial Supreme Court ruling in history. Mm -hmm. The powerful news-making exclusive, Monday night, streaming on ABC News Live, Crime with Lindsay Davis. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. A family on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Take a look at this body cam rescue in New York City Thursday. NYPD officers responded after a teenager fell off a railing into the East River in Manhattan and was having trouble staying above the water. Fortunately, the officers were able to pull the teen to safety. Now to child care. Lawmakers are calling it human infrastructure, a backbone of our economy, and it's an industry in growing crisis with many workers now fleeing for better paying jobs. ABC's Karen Travers reports. <laughs> Leslie Spina has run Kinder Academy in Philadelphia for nearly three decades. She says she's now facing challenges she's never seen before. This is the first time in 27 years that we've had classrooms that are set up and children who want to go in those classrooms and classrooms empty because we don't have the staff in them. There is a child care crisis in this country. The biggest issue, hiring and retaining workers. The child care industry is down more than 125,000 workers nationwide, a more than 10% drop from pre-pandemic levels. Just since June, more than 10,000 child care workers have left the industry, many taking jobs with increasing wages. Child care providers are in the bottom 2% of wage earners across the country. Andy Crozier has worked for Kinder Academy for 20 years. She says she understands why people are leaving her industry. Who wants to come into this field right now? Like, no way. When you're seeing signs that Wawa will pay you $15, $17 an hour, I don't have to worry about children who need extra love, extra attention. Who would come here, honestly? The median wage for a child care worker is just $12.24 an hour. Is that worth it to be able to be struggling this much, to be having to call my family and ask for help with rent? Lauren Nickerson is a former child care worker from Florida who this year shifted to a job as a second grade teacher. She says she loved her job, but for nine years she was living paycheck to paycheck. When I first started, I was being paid minimum wage. Um, luckily, at the time, I was still living at home with my parents. Anytime I'd ask for a raise, it'd be like, that's not possible. No one in this industry gets paid that much. 
Leslie Spina is trying to change that. While she pays her entry-level staff a market rate around $10 to $12 an hour, she offers health, dental and vision benefits, a retirement plan, mental wellness care, a rarity in her field. Still, she wishes she could do more. We're talking about highly qualified professional teachers who are making salaries um, that are ridiculous and shameful. We should be ashamed. I would be so happy if we could pay people a living wage where my teachers with two children didn't qualify for food stamps. But raising fees isn't a feasible option. The majority of families that send their children to Kinder Academy are working class. It's very important that we are here and open and reliable because when they miss work, they don't get paid. Carnina Ginyard sends her four-year-old to Kinder Academy so she can work as a home health aide for her mother. I wouldn't be able to work if I didn't have the proper child care. Um, I feel Neve is safe where she is at Kinder Academy. Um, that's number one for me. American families are on average spending about 13% of their income to pay for child care costs for a child under five. It's very costly for parents. And then you hear how low the wages are. And I think the obvious question then is, you know, so where is the money going to? 50 to 60% of a child care provider's budget goes to personnel, goes to wages. That is not the same for just about any other industry out there. That 50 to 60 percent amounts to a high child to adult ratio so that we have enough adults to take care of children. In Nebraska, North Platte Kids Academy board director David Peterson said the $11 an hour wage they were able to offer just wasn't competitive with other businesses, so they struggled with staffing. In August, Peterson and the board made the difficult decision to shut down. We talked about raising the, the rates that we charge, which we can do, but it starts to become a very cyclical thing because that negatively affects families that can't afford or don't believe they can afford more than that. That closure impacted Rosario Torres, a single mom to her kindergarten daughter and her one-year-old foster daughter. Finding another daycare in town that was open and also open to take a toddler was a lot harder because... A lot of our daycares aren't taking children because they don't have enough staff or they have to reduce staff for the pandemic. Over 50% of all Americans live in childcare deserts in communities where there is an insufficient uh, supply of childcare. Add on, you know, this huge drop in childcare providers and we're, we're seeing that um, families can't get to work. And for many families, it's women who are bearing the burden. More than 1.6 million moms of children under 17 left the workforce during the pandemic and have not returned. Child care is a key component of President Biden's Build Back Better agenda. We need to bring costs down with a significant public investment in our child care industry. His ambitious domestic policy plan would put $225 billion toward child care over the next 10 years, funding for child care providers, raising the minimum wage for child care workers to $15 an hour, and ensuring no middle class families pay more than 7% of their income for child care. The plan also calls for universal free preschool starting at age three. Congress is locked in fierce negotiations over the Build Back Better agenda. How much of a priority is it for him? to ensure that funding for child care workers is included in that final bill? Well, clearly it was a part of his initial proposal. He recognizes uh, the role that child care workers, many of whom also have challenges that are preventing them from the, them from being in the workhorse. Republicans broadly oppose the president's Build Back Better plan because of the roughly $3.5 trillion price tag. But early childhood advocates say this is a pivotal time to act. We have this historic opportunity to fix decades, really, of, of failed child care policy. If we don't get this right, I, I just, I really have to question um, people's commitments to children and families and workers of this country. Leslie Spina believes there's a moral obligation to invest in early childhood education. And as the political fight in Washington continues, she just hopes her business survives. I'm sitting here watching my life's work perhaps dwindle away. And it's very sad. 
It's really very sad. And I hope that that's not what happens. But this is not sustainable. Karen Travers, ABC News, Washington. Our thanks there to Karen Travers. And still ahead here on Prime, the allegations of sexual misconduct rocking the National Women's Soccer League and the extraordinary move the leaders of that group announced. It's one of the most popular shows on Earth, the Korean drama Squid Mania. Why is it so popular? And happy birthday, Disney World. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Speaking of birthdays, one president wishing the oldest living presidents one of the best wishes, and so do we. Happy birthday, President Carter. extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Off we go! This September, across ABC News, the resilience, the strength, overcoming challenges, coming together. This is ABC News, America Strong. This September. is all about this is abc news live all right we're gonna move back let's move back we're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter run urgent delivery run with not afraid to go there so my question mr president what are you so afraid of breaking news live events this is the moment Lift off. <laughs> streaming straight to you anytime anywhere you just met one friend right here you're watching abc news live thanks for streaming with us Roe v. Wade, now for the first time ever on television. She was once the baby at the heart of this landmark decision, and now she breaks her silence almost 50 years later. Why now? What does she want you to know? Your mere conception brought about arguably the most controversial Supreme Court ruling in history. Mm -hmm. The powerful news-making exclusive, Monday night, streaming on ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Now to a birthday half a century in the making. Tonight, we're celebrating Walt Disney World Resort. Disney is the parent company of ABC News. Here's a look by the numbers. Exactly 50 years ago today, Walt Disney World Resort officially opened to guests. The year was 1971. To celebrate, Disney World is putting together an 18-month event featuring new attractions, nighttime spectaculars, and more. About 58 million visitors a year. That's how many people come to Disney World, making it the most visited vacation resort on the planet, according to the company. Disney World covers 43 square miles. That's about the size of San Francisco and two times the size of Manhattan. Back in the mid-1960s, that entire area was purchased by Walt Disney for just $5 million. 70,000 Disney cast members work at the resort, making it the biggest single-site employer in the United States. Eight. That's how many times Disney World has had to close in its 50-year history for Hurricanes Floyd, Charlie, Francis, Jean, Matthew, and Irma after 9-11, and most recently during the COVID pandemic. And lastly, Mickey Mouse was the first cartoon character to ever receive a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And as we all heard in a welcome video when we started at this company, this entire enterprise began with a mouse.
And we still have a ton to get to here on Prime. The mother's frantic 911 call after her 14-month-old falls into a manhole. You will hear the chilling audio. And the fashion mogul agreeing to be extradited to the U.S. on sexual assault charges. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. time anytime nightline now streaming on abc news live 2020 true crime cinematic real life drama stunning the unthinkable follow the clues the hunt true crime 2020 now streaming on abc news live admit it these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day what is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I love you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people. Squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Good job. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Roe v. Wade, now for the first time ever on television. She was once the baby at the heart of this landmark decision, and now she breaks her silence almost 50 years later. Why now? What does she want you to know? Your mere conception brought about arguably the most controversial Supreme Court ruling in history. Mm -hmm. The powerful news-making exclusive, Monday night, streaming on ABC News Live, Crime with Lindsay Davis. It's an antiviral drug so promising, its maker Merck halted final clinical trials early in consultation with the FDA. This is the first uh, oral antiviral that will be available to combat uh, COVID-19. The pharmaceutical company releasing new data about molnupiravir, which cut the risk of hospitalization or death in half in those trials. It actually inserts into the RNA of the virus and stops it from working. And that really is, is the magic of how this works. The drug maker says the prescription pill even appears to work against variants, and they'll soon be taking it to the FDA for emergency use authorization. This as vaccine mandates take effect across the country. California announcing the nation's first statewide shot requirement for school children ages 12 to 17 following full FDA approval. Which will give us time to work with districts, give us time to work with parents and educators. The Supreme Court says Justice Brett Kavanaugh has tested positive for COVID-19. The court says Kavanaugh is experiencing no symptoms and that he and his family have been vaccinated. Well, for the first time, we are hearing the frantic 911 call made by a mother in New Jersey after her son tumbled down a manhole. Henry! 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 911, where's your emergency? I need someone. I need someone to call. There's an open manhole. What? You need somebody where? There's an open manhole. I'm in New Jersey. Henry! Ma'am, give me an address. Henry? What's going on? My son fell in an open 
open manhole. The one-year-old boy falling through that open manhole in Kiwami Park in Union last week, tumbling some seven feet into raw sewage. His mother jumped in and managed to pull the boy out before he was swept away by the water rushing into the hole. Um, they did find two fatalities in that aircraft. Authorities are investigating a deadly mid-air collision in Chandler, Arizona. Two people were killed when a small plane and a helicopter collided near the Chandler Municipal Airport this morning. The chopper crashing, bursting into flames with the two victims on board. The plane was able to land safely on the runway. No one on the plane was hurt. The airport has been closed down for takeoffs and landings. Uh, then we're waiting the arrival of NTSB and the FAA to turn the investigation over to them. Do you understand the significance of this document that you signed, Mr. Nygaard? <clears throat> yes, I do. Canadian fashion designer Peter Nygaard agreeing to be extradited to the U.S. to face a series of assault charges in New York. Sexual assault charges. Nygaard facing six counts of sexual assault and various other charges. Prosecutors say during a 25-year period, the 80-year-old used his company's influence and money to forcibly confine and sexually assault dozens of women and girls. He's facing similar charges in the Bahamas and Canada. He has always unequivocally maintained his innocence of any wrongdoing. Still no winner in the ever-growing Powerball jackpot. Ahead of tomorrow night's drawing, the jackpot is now an estimated $635 million, or $450 million for the lump sum. It's now the sixth largest Powerball jackpot in history, but not even the largest this year. In January, a group in a small town in Maryland won $731 million. The odds of winning Saturday's jackpot? One in 292.2 million. Now to the upheaval in the National Women's Soccer League. They've called off all games this weekend after two coaches were fired amid allegations of misconduct and abusive behavior. The reaction pouring in tonight. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, the National Women's Soccer League canceling all games for the weekend. Two prominent coaches fired amid allegations of misconduct. Paul Riley, head coach of the North Carolina Courage, facing accusations of sexual harassment from several players. Those allegations first surfacing in The Athletic. Players Sinead Farley and Mana Shim going on the record, accusing Riley of making unwanted sexual advances. Other players accusing him of inappropriate comments about players' weight and sexual orientation. Riley denying the majority of the allegations in an email to The Athletic, writing, I have never had sex with or made sexual advances towards these players. Earlier this week, the former head coach of the Washington Spirit, Richie Burke, who had been suspended by the team, also fired after an investigation into allegations of verbal abuse of players. Burke had stepped down as coach in August when the allegations first surfaced. Soccer stars like Megan Rapino slamming the league, tweeting, burn it all down, let their heads roll. Julie Foudy, two-time Olympic gold medalist and minority owner of the Angel City Football Club, speaking out. This is a time of reckoning for this league, honestly, in terms of how they deal with it and how they stand up for the players. Andrew, the league is now acknowledging that this week has been traumatic for both the players and staff. FIFA, the global governing body of soccer, is now launching an investigation into those claims of sexual harassment. Andrew. Ariel, thank you. And turning now to the Netflix Korean drama that has fans around the world obsessed. The show Squid Game has a rare 100% critics rating on Rotten Tomatoes, and it's number one on Netflix in 90 countries. So why is it so popular? ABC's Juju Chang has the story. Squid Game, the latest streaming sensation captivating audiences on Netflix. The Korean drama series, with its dazzling, vivid visuals, accompanied by moments of stunning violence, is not morning TV friendly, to say the least. I would describe Squid Game as a little Hunger Games-esque, but even more violent. Squid Game is about a group of down-on-their-luck contestants forced to compete in life-or-death versions of classic children's games, like Red Light, Green Light, with the promise of millions of dollars at stake for the winner. Just two weeks after debuting, the show is on track to surpass Bridgerton, which was viewed by 82 million people, Netflix's most-watched series of all time. I am yours, Daphne. I have always been yours. 
Yo, wait, I'll be right back. Let me just get another cookie. It's inspiring a TikTok trend. People attempting to complete the show's challenges. And it's Where's even being I? imitated in online gaming platforms like Roblox. The show's star, Lee Jung Jae, an already familiar name in the K-drama industry. But what's behind the show's massive popularity? Korean TV shows and movies, along with other cultural exports like K-beauty and K-pop, have been gaining widespread appeal in the U.S. When you saw the success of Parasite and, and, and how it won the Oscar and, and how people really uh, you know, tuned in to the story of economic inequalities and, and the way that story was told through uh, horror elements. It is a unique way to tell those stories, and I think there's an appetite for it. The themes and brutal subject matter of Squid Game resonating with viewers who may be looking for an escape from a world that sometimes feels out of control. We watch things that make us uncomfortable because it removes us from the uh, problems that we're having. It's allowing you to make a decision. Our thanks to Juju Chang. And extreme weather events have short and long-term consequences that can leave those most affected drowning in debt. It's sometimes impossible to prepare for the worst, but when it comes, what you do next could be decisive in how quickly you return to normal. ABC News' Rena Roy has tips you should follow to ensure a prompt recovery after a natural disaster. <laughs> Floods, fires, hurricanes, tornadoes. These extreme weather events can be devastating for homeowners. Once the storm has passed, it's time to start the rebuilding process, and that means dealing with your homeowner's insurance. According to Consumer Reports, the first step is to file a claim with your insurance carrier as soon as you can. Even if you are not able to get to your home, it's good to at least contact the company. When you get a chance then to get more information about what's happening with your home, that's when you can fill in the details. Next, get out your phone and take a walk around your home to record the damage. Make a list of items that were destroyed or might need repair. It's very important to document as much damage as you can, both externally and internally. And of course, use your smartphone a lot to do that. If there's major damage to your home, you should take steps to prevent it from getting worse. It's important to do stopgap work even as you are just filing the claim. The insurance company does not want to see that you report something and then you wait around for it to get worse. Your insurance carrier will assign an adjuster to your claim to determine the value of any damages or losses. It's very important to record the conversations that you have with the adjuster and or just to document on paper what the conversations were so that if there are any problems or disagreements later and you have to go to court or something like that, you have documentation of what you were told. Know what your policy covers and what it doesn't. Coverage plans vary and the differences may affect what payments you'll get. And finally, be patient. It can be a very trying process. It can take some people a very long time to get everything restored and just have patience and uh, document everything. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. It's the first day of October, and while most of us are preparing for fall and getting ready for Halloween, retailers are saying that we better get moving on Christmas and holiday shopping starting now. Shipping bottlenecks, production shortages, and rising prices are already impacting what's in stores and online, and the holiday rush could make it even worse. Trey Bodge, smart shopping expert at TrueTrade.com, is back to explain how to avoid delays and stay back on budget. Welcome back. So, Trey, first, just give us an overview of what's actually happening right now and what it could mean for the holidays. Sure. So thanks for having me back. It is a very complex situation, but essentially at the beginning of the pandemic just kicked things off and created a domino effect of shortages, bottlenecks, uh, labor issues as well. And so my, I'm expecting things to really tighten up around the holiday shopping season. So I am advising that consumers start shopping a little bit earlier. And so given those potential shortages, do we need to buy everything early? Thankfully not. So the things that I would focus on right now are very specific items. So for instance, if a child on your list wants a toy, for instance, that they saw on a hot toy list, or if a teen looks for something on TikTok and it's trending and they want that item, those are the things that I would buy right now. If you have more general things like, you know, 
bags of coffee or candles or blankets, things like that, I think you'll be fine to buy those general things a little bit later in the season. Now, what if our viewers just don't have the money in their budget to shop so early and are still saving up for holiday shopping? Right. So again, I would focus on those very specific items right now. And, you know, many credit cards offer you the opportunity to spread out your purchases over a few months interest free. So I would look at that. And then also many major retailers like Amazon, Macy's, Bloomingdale's, Walmart, they offer buy now, pay later services. Now, each one of those services is a little bit different. So you want to read the fine print and see if they're charging you interest or not, or what happens if you default on the payment. But that's another option, option to spread out your financial outlay right now. And I want to follow up on my last question. So how do you suggest saving money if you're buying before all those holiday sales start up? Sure. So, of course, if we're buying right now, we're not taking advantage of those great holiday sales like over Black Friday and Cyber Monday. But there are a lot of tools that I would recommend that people use to save before the holiday shopping season starts. So I work with a bunch of these platforms. There are a couple that I'll share with you. If you're shopping online, I would recommend Rakuten. They have a browser extension called the Rakuten Cashback button. And once you install it, it alerts you to available cashback. It compares prices for you. It runs coupons for you at checkout. So that's an easy way to save while you're shopping online. And then if you're shopping in store, try another company that I work with called Coupon Cabin. I like their smart, uh, smartphone app because they have an in-store tab that you click on. and It'll let you know if there are available savings that you can use right at checkout. But there are lots of tools like this. Uh, you can look at Slick Deals and uh, Retail Me Not, Honey, lots and lots of great ones. So definitely use it one, at least one smart shopping app on your phone and one browser extension on your computer. I'm a Honey user myself there. And finally, what are the best backup options if you can't find what you're looking for or you do end up leaving everything until the last minute? Sure. So there are a lot of great digital gifts out there. So for instance, subscription boxes, I'm a big fan of those. And you can get a subscription box for a recipient with, uh, with wine, with coffee, with clothes, with toys. There are so many great options there. And you can buy one month or three months or six months. So that's a really good option, especially for your last minute shopping. And I also love digital gift cards. Uh, you can buy those and get them very, very quickly. And you can even personalize them. There's a company I work with called perfectgift.com, where in just a minute or so, you can create a personalized gift card with your own photo or artwork on it and a personalized message, and those ship in a day or two. So even if you're pushing things until the very last minute, you have lots of great digital options to check out. It's October 1st, but we're already talking holiday shopping. Thank you, Trey Bodge, our smart shopping expert at truetray.com. Thanks for having me. And finally here, a, brush, a breath of fresh air for some Florida teens in foster care. Sail Future has been teaching economically disadvantaged kids in the Tampa Bay area how to operate sailboats since 2013, and now they've recently launched a free private high school with a unique curriculum aimed at equipping teens with the skills and resources necessary to achieve life and achieve financial independence. It's tonight's America Strong. All right, before we can light these engines up, what do we got to do? Check cooler levels. 16-year-old Bobby Bias didn't always have the answers. Up until last year, he'd never even been on a boat. As Bobby entered foster care last year, surrounded by strangers, he says he was closed off with a bad attitude and felt directionless living at a group home. Most of the time, it was, it was just hard there. At my other group home, you know, none of the kids were really, like, tight, like, close together. But Bobby says everything changed when his friend Blake told him about a program that offered housing Some and a different approach to foster up. care. It would eventually become his family. I've seen how he was at the, his other group home. Now, I, like, I look at him as a little brother. When I moved in here, I feel like I had a support system. I feel like I had people that really cared about me. Bombi says his life has been changed by Sail Future, an innovative program looking for ways to get troubled teens engaged, most notably through sailing. Trust and relationship building. When you're on a sailboat, you have no choice. You have to work together as a team. You have to build that foundation of a relationship. Michael Long is the man behind the organization. It started off in 2013 when he volunteered to run an after-school sailing program for teens at risk of being expelled from their schools. Today, the program has morphed into a new co-ed, tuition-free, private entrepreneurship high school that recently opened in St. Petersburg with high hopes of teaching students how to think critically and solve real-world problems. Sailing is just one part of their hands-on curriculum. 
just as we use sailing as a vehicle to teach leadership, teamwork, trust, respect, we've used construction to do the same. The project-based nature of the education is what allows them to grasp the concept that the common standards want us to teach. It's just doing so in a different way. It may bounce off Tyshawn's forehead. STEM instructor Marvin Peoples taught in Florida's public education system for 15 years before coming to Sail Future. He says even though lesson planning can be challenging, he's never had this much undivided attention from students. They definitely show um, greater interest. Uh, greater and, and interest. progress. Absolutely. Uh, I wasn't as really as efficient as teachers uh, when we were teaching to a standardized test or, or having them memorize something that they don't have any interest in. And um, this right here was just a different opportunity. With its recent launch, the school is all digital. Textbooks and lesson plans come from computers, and there are no letter grades. Students instead get detailed, personalized feedback on where they're struggling and excelling relative to Florida state academic standards. College isn't necessarily the goal for these kids upon graduation. It's financial independence. Students must come from households living under the poverty line to qualify for admission at Sale Future, which is funded by government vouchers and private scholarships. For students that want to go on to college, um, they're going to be just fine. For students that want to go on to become small business owners, they've got the, the skills and the experiences and the network to go on and do that day one. Pretty much right there. Five, sixteen. I have construction all day today. So right now we're trying to build like a small business and we're building benches. I wanted to be a computer engineer, so they started making me do JavaScript and stuff like that, getting me on coding, and, and that's pretty hard. Now, this is what I've been looking for and learning, to be honest, because I, I didn't like the way how the other schools were really teaching me. Back out on the water, students are busy gearing up, rigging the sails, and even take the helm as part of the crew of eight. Expeditions can range from a few hours in Tampa Bay to a three-month journey along the East Coast. The hope that the bonds made and lessons learned can have a lasting impact. Uh, two kids in my house that lived with me in my other group home, we used to argue a lot and now we argue about who can sail better. I didn't know what I want to do. Now I want to be a captain chartering boats like this. CEO Michael Long says it's that turnaround of Bobby's mindset and so many other Florida teens that put Sail Future's mission into perspective. He was once a troubled teen himself who lives on a sailboat out of necessity. We are quite literally breaking these cycles of poverty and abuse and paving step-by-step -step pathways to economic freedom and social mobility. And uh, I can't think of anything better to be doing with my time and energy. For ABC News, Victor Okendo in St. Petersburg, Florida. Our thanks there to Victor Okendo. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. It was media day in the fourth tallest building here in New York. They're calling it the Summit. It's a new glass bottom and mirrored observation deck, 1,000 feet in the air. It looks beautiful and terrifying at the same time from this pic. I don't know. I'll probably check it out. Why not? That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things, including the new body cam just released in the Gabby Petito case, what police saw when they responded to a domestic dispute 911 call. The woman behind bars finding purpose. You won't believe the work they're doing with dogs that could have a life-saving result. extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run.
How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love, the hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Roe v. Wade, now for the first time ever on television. She was once the baby at the heart of this landmark decision. And now she breaks her silence almost 50 years later. Why now? What does she want you to know? Your mere conception brought about arguably the most controversial Supreme Court ruling in history. Mm -hmm. The powerful newsmaking exclusive Monday night streaming on ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. I'm Andrew Dimbert filling in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We're monitoring several, several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A former student opened fire inside a Houston charter school, injuring an employee. That employee was shot in the back and taken to the hospital in serious condition. No students were injured and the 25 year old suspect was taken into custody. In a case filed by the Justice Department, a federal judge today questioning the legality of Texas's restrictive abortion law that was enforced just last month. The judge called the design of the Texas law that doesn't make exceptions for rape or incest, very unusual. The judge did not indicate how he would rule. Scarlett Johansson and Disney have settled the Black Widow lawsuit the star filed back in July. The suit claimed that the studio sacrificed the film's box office potential in order to grow its Disney Plus streaming service. Disney countered that Johansson was paid $20 million for the film. All eyes are still on Washington and those negotiations over the major spending bills on nation's roads, bridges and highways, and on addressing health care, child care and climate change. President Biden made a trip to Capitol Hill today to meet with Democrats, saying he's confident they will reach a deal, but there will be no vote tonight. ABC's Rachel Scott has the latest. With his domestic agenda on the line, President Biden today traveling to Capitol Hill to try and unite his own party. Mr. President, any compromise? The president meeting with House Democrats for just over half an hour. I'm telling you, we're going to get this done. It doesn't matter when. It doesn't matter whether it's in six minutes, six days, or six weeks. We're going to get it done. Sources in the meeting tell us the president floated a compromise between moderates in the Senate and progressives in the House a $1.9 to $2.2 trillion price tag for a sweeping bill covering everything from early childhood education to health care to fighting climate change. Progressives want $3.5 trillion, saying until there's a vote on that, they won't support the separate bipartisan infrastructure we bill. We need a vote. We need, a, we need to be real. Are we going to deliver universal pre-K to this country or not? Are we going to expand health care to our seniors and include vision and dental or not? But the head of the Progressive Caucus hinting if Speaker Pelosi and President Biden can reach an ironclad agreement with moderate Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, that might be enough. I want to be assured that there is no delay and that there's no misunderstandings about what we agreed to. Um, and so if there's something else that's short of a vote that somebody can offer me that gives me those same assurances, I want to listen to that. But Jayapal saying... They're not there yet. Is, does your, does half your you down. Me? Yeah. I'm here, baby. I'm here. <laughs> 
And House leadership aides tell us tonight that there will not be a vote on the bipartisan infrastructure package tonight. The House is now scheduled to go on recess for two weeks, uh, leaving that bipartisan infrastructure vote up in the air at this point. I talked to one member leaving the meeting after President Biden's uh, meeting here on the Hill today. Uh, that member told me that they are frustrated, that there's no timeline, that there's no strategy, and after weeks of negotiations, they are not any closer at this point to reaching a deal. Andrew? All right, our thanks to Rachel tracking it all. And switching gears now, another potential weapon in the fight against COVID-19 could soon be on the way, with drug maker Merck releasing promising new data on a treatment for the virus. This is many across the country fight vaccine mandates, but some who have survived the disease are urging them to take the shot. ABC's Witt Johnson has more. Tonight, a potential game changer in the battle against the virus. The first antiviral medication specifically designed to treat COVID-19. Pharmaceutical giant Merck announcing that trials show its new drug, Molnupiravir, may cut the risk of hospitalization or death in half. This is a pill you can take at home and it will significantly reduce the risk that you either ultimately are hospitalized or more importantly, that you would ever fa face the unfortunate uh, outcome of death. The drug course consists of four pills taken every 12 hours for five days, beginning soon after testing positive. The trial included 775 patients with mild to moderate COVID who had at least one risk factor for severe disease. After 29 days, no deaths reported in patients who received the drug, compared to eight deaths in patients who got a placebo. The drug also appeared to be effective against variants of concern like the Delta strain. To take something which is such a devastating disease like COVID-19 and, and hopefully turns it into something that's manageable. Merck saying the results of their phase three trial were so promising, they ended it more than a month early with support from the FDA and plan to apply for emergency use authorization within days. The news uh, of the efficacy of this particular antiviral is obviously very good news. They will be submitting their data to the FDA imminently. Uh, the data are impressive. While other treatments like monoclonal antibodies require patients to be infused at a hospital or clinic, these pills would only need a prescription and could be taken at home. Data on two more antiviral drugs from Pfizer and Roche are also expected in the coming months. But health officials insist they are not replacements for the vaccine. Vaccination is our best defense against COVID-19. We have the scientific tools needed to put an end to this pandemic. Across the country, a sweeping push for vaccine mandates. California today becoming the first state in the nation to require the vaccine for all students as soon as it gets final FDA approval for each age group. We want to end this pandemic. We are all exhausted by it. The governor pointing out that schools already require multiple vaccines for diseases like measles and mumps, saying vaccines work. <laughs> And in New York City, despite protests and a last-minute appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, which was denied, time running out late today for school staff to get vaccinated or lose their jobs by Monday. It wasn't an easy decision because, you know, I'm giving up first and foremost how I support my family. You know, I'm, I'm a single mom. Still, the city saying 90 percent of school employees now have at least one shot. This mandate has worked, and the goal was protect, to protect kids, including our youngest kids who can't be vaccinated yet. And tonight, word of another breakthrough infection. The Supreme Court confirming Justice Brett Kavanaugh has tested positive for COVID-19. He's been vaccinated since January and is currently showing no symptoms. Our thanks to Wit. Next tonight, the hunt for Brian Laundry, the person of interest connected to the Gabby Petito case. New police body camera has surfaced showing what police in Utah saw when they answered a 911 call about a domestic dispute. Victor Okendo is down in Florida with the details. Tonight, newly released body camera footage revealing more about this domestic incident between Ryan Laundry and his girlfriend Gabby Petito, one of the last times they were seen together and she was seen alive. Did you get hit in the face? Officers in Moab, Utah, responding to a 911 call in August. Witnesses say they saw Brian hit Gabby. Did he hit you though? I guess, yeah, but I hit him first. Where did he hit you? Don't, don't worry, just be honest. Like, like, 
Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, he didn't like, hit me in the face. Like, he didn't like, punch me in the face or anything. Police noticing bruises on her body, Some pressing struggles. Petito. Did he slap yeah. your face or what? Well, like, he like, grabs me like, with his nail, and I guess that's why it looks like I definitely have a cut right here. So I can feel it. Yeah. Ryan telling officers his side of the story. She gets really worked up, and when she does, she swings and she had her cell phone in her hand, so I was just trying to push her away. The officers then discussing the incident and what to do next. In no way, shape, or form that I can perceive does what happened here, a little slap fight between fiancés who love each other and want to be together, can I perceive that this is going to digress into the situation where he's going to be a battered man? Right. But then again, I don't have a crystal ball. Officers deciding to separate the two for the night, putting Ryan in a hotel, Gabby sleeping in their white van, neither pressing charges. Now an independent investigation into how the police department handled this call. We've reached out to the city of Moab, and because of the investigation, they're not commenting at this time. Andrew? Our thanks to Victor Okendo. Turning now to a story about finding renewed purpose. A group of women behind bars in Couchilla, California, are training dogs to be guardian angels with a remarkable and life-changing ability, predicting epileptic seizures. So how do they do it? Here's ABC's Matt Gutman. He really likes shoulder massages. 24-year-old Natalie Tapio's lab, Dexter, Take a break. isn't her pet. He's her guardian. Dexter is my service dog. Boy, this here. Yeah. He alerts to my seizures. Natalie suffers from a form of epilepsy that can leave her physically frozen in place. Good morning. Dexter is a finely calibrated four-legged seizure monitor. So sensitive, he warns Natalie before a seizure is coming on. And he does that by tapping his paw on her leg. He will alert me and then dial a dog phone which has my parents' phone numbers on it, and then retrieves a pouch, which will have any necessities for me, like um, medication, water, my cell phone. I'm gonna pause for a second. He's alerting oh. again. Natalie received Dexter through a program called Little Angels Service Dogs, a nonprofit organization that trains dogs to work with people in need. Surprisingly, those furry little angels are raised and largely trained at Central California Women's Facility, the second largest female prison in the U.S. And their trainers... How many of the women here have been convicted of a violent crime? So basically everybody. The program is called PUPS, short for Pups Uplifting Prisoners' Spirits. It's as much about rehabilitating those inmates as it is training their furry charges. This isn't just about training a dog. These are training service dogs that save lives. Amy Davis, a lead trainer in the program, is serving a life sentence. I have done something that landed me in prison that was horrible. I participated in a robbery murder. <sighs> During that time, I was in a what I thought was a very unhealthy relationship. I was on drugs and I was very broken and lost. She says the pups program has restored her sense of self-worth. When that, an eight week old puppy weighing 20 pounds was put in my arm, it was like every wall I put up to protect myself, every wall I thought I had, it just melted. Inmate Manette Packard likens it to having an infant. When you have that dog, it's like an umbilical cord. What you're feeling may feel, especially when they're puppies. Amber Ingram is the group's lead trainer. She's been an inmate for 10 years. Tell me what you were convicted of. Well, I was convicted originally of um, child endangerment resulting in death for my five-year-old son, Brayden. Sorry. Um, later on, a couple months later, I got um, charged with second-degree murder for not protecting him. Her then-boyfriend, Eduardo Zamora Jr., had been violently abusing her son. And I got a phone call from my boyfriend at the time, and he basically said, my son's not breathing. And I said, what did you do? That was my initial reaction, what did you do? And um, he had um, beaten my son to death. Zamora was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to 23 years to life in prison for the death of Amber's son. And yet you got convicted of second-degree murder? Yes. So a, um, a parent is, you're supposed to protect your child. So because I didn't protect him and I didn't leave and I didn't speak up and I didn't do that, they charged me with the actual second-degree murder. My punishment is me having to live with my son's death for the rest of my life. Has the dog program helped you deal with the guilt and the shame? 
Absolutely. I can't allow anything bad to happen to this dog. If someone were to want to kick my dog, I'm jumping in front of it. Like, I am super protective of what I do, and I do it in honor of my son, Brayden, every single day. Dana Fruman is a Little Angels program manager and representative here in the prison. In 2017, she brought the dogs here to the facility, taking a chance on what was then a new initiative. So what's more rewarding for you, seeing the change in the humans or seeing the change in the animals that are trained? When I got here, I realized that these are women with stories and their heart-wrenching stories, and they were so open and honest, it changed me, because I realized that the dogs weren't just changing the recipients' lives, they were changing their lives. Natalie's was one of those lives irrevocably changed. Before she got Dexter, those seizures had robbed her of her independence. The seizures were so unpredictable and silent, usually, mm -hmm. and so there's always has to be someone very attentive um, close by. My mom and I were basically inseparable. <laughs> Natalie was actually cooking bacon at the stove and she had the pan in her hand and she was frozen in a seizure. When I turned and looked and I just went over there um, and, you know, got the pan out of her hand and got her away from the stove and turned it off. Lisa looked for a way that Natalie could live a more normal life and she came across little angels. Natalie was picked as a candidate, okay. and Little Angel started the process of conditioning Dexter to okay. predict her seizures. He was taught this alert game, which is a paw at the leg. And then when he got that game down was when it was time for us to send samples of my seizure scent. So whenever I had a seizure, to take some gauze and wipe the um, palms of my hands and the insides in my cheeks um, with the gauze and mail it to little angels. And so he learned to associate the game with the scent. In 2018, the pair finally met and Dexter's training was put to the test when he detected an oncoming seizure. We were all just bawling. We were just so excited. Like you could just see like how different like our lives were gonna be. People with Epilepsy um, often have um, this constant um, kind of cloud over their head or worry in the back of their mind um, of when will the next seizure happen, where will I be, what will I be doing, and I don't need to have that anymore. And so that's very free. Thanks to Matt for that powerful report. And still to come, the new volcanic concerns in that Spanish island. And what does a royal wedding look like if you're no longer a royal? Stay with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live.
It's all about you. This is American history of violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. A family on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. The volcano erupting in the Canary Islands for almost three weeks now just won't let up. Officials warning the biggest tragedy is ahead with new fissures opening last night and one of the lava paths heading straight towards a populated village in La Palma. Already 1,000 structures have been affected. 1,200 more are at risk. The time has come to give Australians their lives back. That's what Prime Minister Scott Morrison said as Australia prepares to reopen their borders after an eight 18 month travel ban. No tourists yet, though. The rule only allows fully vaccinated Australians and permanent residents to enter the country with a seven day quarantine. And move over British royals. It's time to let the Russian royals shine. For the first Russian royal wedding in more than a century, it took place in St. Petersburg's Russia today. Grand Duke George Mikhailovich tied the knot with his Italian fiance at St. Isaac's Cathedral. Hundreds of guests were in attendance. Next tonight, we break down the difficult conversations of what it means to be a brown girl in the United States, the constant feeling of being othered, and how to cope with the emotional turmoil. Here to help us unpack these issues is Latinx activist and author of For Brown Girls with Sharp Edges and Tender Hearts, a love letter to women of color, Prisca Rodriguez. This is a book that serves as a guide for women of color. Prisca, it's great speaking with you. Now, you start the book with a message titled Dear Brown Girls, where you share some of the truths and struggles of what it means to be a brown girl are living in the United States. What are those struggles? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I think it's the struggles of being a person of color, the struggles of um, not reading white. And so what it means in a white supremacist society to function, to attempt to thrive, to, you know, get admitted to school, get jobs, get married. It, it just looks just a little bit different than it would if you're white. And we are oftentimes just fed this white narrative as the everyone narrative. And let's touch on a thorny topic that's often overlooked within the Latinx community, and that's colorism. You say that you experienced it firsthand when your mother told you to stay away from the sun to avoid being too brown. Loaded question here, but how should Latinx individuals tackle racism when the community itself doesn't acknowledge it to be a problem? I think hopefully with information like this, you can't tackle what you don't even know is there. So I give an exhaustive bibliography and notes in the back with a lot of references. If you're a statistics person, if you like graphs, go there to seek that information. <laughs> um, but I think we, I'm hoping that the way that I'm approaching the topic will enable us to be more willing to have that conversation. Because unfortunately, we don't even know what a lot of, like a colorism, we've heard, a, it's a buzzword. We've heard a lot about it, but a lot of people don't actually know what that means. So explaining it, giving people all the tools that they would need to go and have that conversation, I hope is the beginning of us beginning to have honest conversations because we have experienced it and we're just not willing enough to talk about it. In your book, you also write about diversity and not feeling welcomed in white spaces. Do you have any tips for brown girls on how to navigate being in an uncomfortable space that wasn't originally designed for them? I sort of talk about it at the end of my imposter syndrome chapter. I think that the best thing that we can do is acknowledge the fear, acknowledge the 
all the systems in place that make us feel this way uh, and knowing that there are systems in place that make us feel these ways and then doing it despite it all. Like speak even if your mouth is quivering. <laughs> Stand tall even if you want to hide in a corner and cry because we can't allow the fear that does dominate us when we are othered, when we're not like everyone else, when nobody in positions of power looks like us, it takes us, it's almost like a performance art. Roll your shoulders back and just keep going, even if you're scared out of your mind. You touched on it there a little bit, imposter syndrome and brown girls feeling that way in the work place. You called it an internalized oppression, a cycle of playing catch up and blaming ourselves for something we have no control over. Could that way of thinking be crippling? Uh, unpack it for us, if you will. So the term imposter syndrome is an actual psycho uh, psychotherapy term. It is a term that is valid enough that it has it has been in it's 1983, I think, is the book that begins that conversation. So it is a very real term. It does impact people specifically if you're if you weren't part of like the initial working community, like men, white, straight, able-bodied men dominated the workplaces in the United States for years before women went in there, before people of color went in there, before black people went in there specifically. So it is a very real term. And I try to break that down. I give you all the tools to know the history of it. And also, once you know the term, it gives you so much language. I have named my imposter syndrome posse. <laughs> So that when I see her coming, I feel the doubt because it's there. Pretending it's not there is is not the solution. It's better to just see it, acknowledge it, and then move on despite it, that I think that we can actually move forward. And your book is also a celebration of brownness, along with healing and being resilient. You end the last chapter saying, brown girl, this world does not want to see you survive it, so defy it and dare to thrive. What message do you want to leave readers with? I want them to feel inspired to find each other, to find, to give this book to their families, to have new conversations that maybe they weren't encouraged to have. I want them to sample from my fearlessness. I want, I just, I know what I, I was a person that read Judy Bloom at 12 years old and thought, I was like, this is all I have. So I have to attach myself to this and this represents me <laughs> and it didn't. So I hope that this book provides that representation from somebody that looks like y'all and then gives you somewhere to start it. We, we, we don't have a book like this and I hope that with it, we can move. Thank you, Prisca. Four Brown Girls with Sharp Edges and Tender Hearts, A Love Letter to Women of Color is out now wherever books are sold. And finally, before we go tonight, a celebratory milestone. It's the 50th anniversary of Walt Disney World Resort, and Ginger Z is there bringing us a behind-the-scenes look at all the magic that's in store. It's Walt Disney World's most magical celebration. A new dazzling iridescent glow on icons transforming at night into beacons of magic. Take a selfie with these new golden sculptures popping up in all four parks. The all new Kite Tales, taking some of our favorite characters to new heights. I've got Adrian and Miles, my boys with me. You ready? Yeah! <laughs> First stop, Epcot at the reimagined France Pavilion, inspired by the flavorful world of the movie favorite, Ratatouille. Taste check, spoon down. One, two, three. <laughs> let's go see what Chef Remy's got cooked up. Come on, let's go, let's go. Woohoo! Wait for me. We're off to Remy's Ratatouille adventure. Ratatouille! Now it's time to eat a local favorite at the new restaurant, La Creperie 
de Paris. It's so important to bring them a little taste mm. of France and culture. Bon appétit. Behind this door is one of the most highly anticipated attractions, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. Cameras haven't been in here until now. Ready? Let's do this. Something extra special about this specific uh, attraction starts backward. It does. This is Disney's first reverse launch coaster. And then another piece of it is, is that we can now rotate you to any direction. Want to really meet the excitement and the energy and the scale of these Guardian of the Galaxy movies and hopefully doing that here too for all of our guests. That was awesome! Powerhouse, Christina Aguilera kicking off the 50th festivities. The Disney magic comes to life with two never before seen nighttime extravaganzas. Harmonious, Epcot's largest nighttime spectacular ever. The breathtaking show featuring Disney songs in more than a dozen languages from 240 artists all over the world. Remember me. Including a favorite from the movie Coco, sung by the five-time Grammy-nominated Louis Fonsi. This is Remember Me Reimagined. I got to sing it with a, with a dear friend, Joy, who is an amazing artist from Mexico, and to be a part of something that's gonna be here for, hopefully for a very long time, it's one for the record books for me. And the all-new Disney enchantment illuminating over the Magic Kingdom. Our thanks to Ginger, and Disney is the parent company of ABC News. That's our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Andrew Dimbert. Thanks for streaming with us. now and America this morning the best new video the breaking news overnight emergency crews called to the town of Surfside US airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria the stories people are talking about you don't want to shave your legs don't I was gonna say, oh my Got it. and what to expect in the day ahead ABC World News Now and America this morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern up all night to keep you up to date it was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Off we go! This September, across ABC News, the resilience, the strength, overcoming challenges, coming together. This is ABC News, America Strong. This September. is all about this is abc news live all right we're gonna move back let's move back we're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter we're on an urgent delivery run with not afraid to go there so my question mr president what are you so afraid of breaking news live events this is the moment Lift off. streaming straight to you anytime anywhere you just met one friend right here you're watching abc news live thanks for streaming with us
We had to gut the kitchen out, literally gut it out. All these light fixtures were complete, are gone. All that, if it looks like dirt, it's not, trust me, it was roaches. So. This is what's left um, at one of Catherine Esposito's rental properties in San Antonio, Texas. I've owned this property for a long time, and then to walk into something like this and have it totally destroyed, it's, it's heartbreaking. She claims last year, the tenants who lived here stopped paying rent and trashed the property. And because of nationwide eviction moratoriums in place at the time, Catherine couldn't do anything to force them out. I essentially, as a landlord, in my opinion, have paid people to live there on my property. It's a common misconception that every American property owner is inherently wealthy. But nearly half of all rental units in the U.S. are owned by mom and pop landlords like Catherine, who have at most a few properties and often rely on the rental income for their own mortgages, expenses, and retirement. Catherine says between lost rental income and the cost of renovating this ruined property, she's now fallen deeply in debt during the pandemic. Financially, just in the house loan and the repairs, it's going to run me probably close to thirty, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. I have the kitchen cabinets that are in here right now. Um, they got totally destroyed. She but she did seem to have a lifeline, a turning our, to the uh, state's emergency rental relief program, part of an enormous of national pot of money designed to keep tenants and landlords afloat. In fact, since December, Congress has earmarked more than $46 billion for emergency rental assistance, or ERA. That money was turned over to states and localities to distribute. But by the end of August, across the country, only about 17% of it had made it into the hands of renters. There are millions of people out there who have no idea the program exists. The reason for this is because it's largely available online. We have not invested nearly enough in, in publicizing the program and making sure people know about it. And I would imagine the highest percentage of people who don't have access to the internet are people who are struggling to pay their rent. There's no question. ERA applications can be long and confusing, frequently requiring extensive documentation. It's intended to prevent fraud, but it inadvertently slows down the process. They have the authority to significantly simplify these programs, and they have to do that. You know, when somebody walks into a store, we don't ask them to prove that they're not going to shoplift. We literally know where these people live. And so I think we have to really give them the benefit of the doubt. Texas is one of the most effective states in rolling out its aid. Nearly 61% of its 1.3 billion rental relief dollars have been paid out. This is the bathroom. But Catherine says she was effectively shut out of the funds because her tenants didn't complete their portion of the application. And as a result, Catherine says she has had zero rental income here for about a year and a half. It is gross. The tenants did not respond to requests for comment. I paid the water bill for them so they could at least have the water to, you know, since they had three kids here. When they had the chance, they would pay me, reimburse me for it. Now Catherine is doing whatever she can to make ends meet. I've mowed yards. I've done worked at a concession stand. I've delivered groceries. I've gone to the food pantry. I look at a nightstand. Instead of throwing it away, I'm like, okay. I can sell it for $10. That will buy me a box of mud to fix a house. With nowhere left to turn, she decided to sell one of her other properties. And because now there's no eviction moratoriums in place here, a new owner could force out Catherine's good tenants, like Mark, who she's known for years. It's just not fair. And uh, it's hard to live with that. Some of these people I've gotten really attached to. I consider them like family. and. To have to put them out is not, you know, it's not a good feeling. I've been on this property for like around 12 years. Mark says as hard as things got during the pandemic, he never missed a payment to Catherine. The ones of us that have been here for a long time have gotten kind of attached to this place, you know, and we've become friends with Kathy over the years. I wish somebody would, could do something. The Texas Rental Relief Program tells ABC News missing federally required documentation creates the most significant delays, and processing time for applications usually takes 62 days. And remember, this program is one of the nation's most efficient. 
New York, meanwhile, has been one of the slowest states to distribute ERA funding. In fact, by June, it was the only state that had not distributed a single dollar of the federal money. In the case of New York, the state legislature sat on it for an unconscionable period of time, and um, they've been playing catch up ever since. And that's just a shame. It was not necessary. Anna Roman is waiting on that money. Let's go in, have a good day. That's my girl. She's a single mom from the Bronx with four children, including an adult daughter with autism who Anna cares for around the clock. If you were to be evicted from your home, what would that mean for your life? I don't know. I don't know what to tell my daughter. What am I going to tell her? I messed up again? And Anna has already seen rock bottom. Nearly 30 years ago, she served time for multiple felonies and was homeless at one point, but she fought to turn her life around. And she says even prison and life on the street was easier than battling COVID-19 last year. You actually thought you might die. It felt like it. It really did. I've been shot. It was worse than when you got shot. Yes. When I got shot, I remember it just hurts and it hurts and it hurts. And I know that the pain is going to go away. But with COVID, when is it going to go away? I'm still a year later and I'm still in pain. Well, I got to help other people. Bedridden for months, Anna fell behind. And now she owes about $9,000 in rent. Like Catherine, Anna turned to her state's rental relief program, which she found through a flyer at her church, something she saw as a miracle. I take total responsibility. And I'm not asking for no handouts. When I was in that Bronx Works, it gave me a dignity. All the medical documents, this is my W-2. We have access to your email. Yes. Bronx Works is a community-based organization helping people navigate this complicated rental assistance application process. This is very typical of what we see in a group population, people whose English isn't their first language, just even uploading documents. Not everyone has a laptop at home. Not everyone has Wi-Fi at home. Shali Sharma oversees this delicate operation in one of the most underserved and low-income communities in New York. A lot of people in our community have history of shelter stays and they're very risk, very high risk of becoming homeless. And so they're doing homelessness prevention here. Bronx Works helped Anna apply, but now 10 weeks later, her application is still pending. What kind of difference would that make for you if this were to come through? I would be the happiest leprechaun ever. I would feel like, wow, you know what? I'm, I'm blessed. There, there is goodness. New York has recently picked up its pace in distributing ERA money, to date dispersing $586 million to more than 45,000 landlords owed overdue rent. The state says getting relief money out the door as quickly as possible remains a top priority for our agency. And all renters in New York, like Anna, who have submitted a completed application, are protected from eviction while it's pending. But the clock is ticking. Starting October 1st, the Department of Treasury can take those billions in unused funds and redistribute it to local governments that have been getting out their aid more effectively. This seems to be a unique circumstance in that both the renters and the landlords want the same thing here. I'm not aware of any time in history when the interests of landlords and tenants have been so closely aligned. We have now a situation where the answer is not a moratorium. The answer is getting the money into the hands of the people who need it. There is a bill currently pending in Congress trying to expedite disbursements by allowing landlords to apply for back rent, increasing outreach about the rental relief program, and simplifying the application process. I can't, I can't create miracles. I can ask for one, but I can't create it. And in Texas, it's in that uncommon bond between tenant and landlord that Catherine Esposito is holding strong. You know, sometimes you just need a hug, and that's all it takes to keep you going. I just wish somebody was looking out for her, you know. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live.
It's all about you. This is American history of violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast of family truth. on a mission to find...